You don't get this kind of unbridled joy in anything else. It's finally time for the Champions League. Over the next eight months, we'll decide the best club in football. But who has the edge, and what are the storylines you need to know throughout the season? Well, lucky for you, we've spent a week answering those very questions for you. These are seven storylines for the 2019-2020 Champions League. Number one, the English sides. England has had a bit of a checkered past in the Champions League. Of course, there was Man United winning the treble, but then you had a time where English sides seemed to be struggling mightily to even get out of the group stage, let alone have success. Well, last year changed all that. It was two English sides in the final for the Champions League. It was two English sides in the final for the Europa League. Liverpool wins it. Everybody's happy. But does that mean that England as a country continues to send sides that will be successful in the Champions League. Well, we'll have to see. Of the four teams that are in it right now, Liverpool, Man City, Chelsea, and Tottenham, only Liverpool did not make some major changes to what they're doing. Even City brought in a couple new players, guys like Rodri and João Cancelo. And of course for Chelsea, they brought in a new coach as well as some of the players that they added, like Christian Pulisic, but also players that they subtracted, like Eden Hazard. Liverpool broke the curse last year, like I said, but the money would suggest that England should continue to be as dominant as they were last year. I think it's possible given the four teams that are in right now, all four of them have exceptional quality. But the packed fixture schedule that comes part and parcel with the top teams in the Premier League, which we'll get to, often means that they struggle to perform in the Champions League. What it all comes down to is a side like Liverpool that was so far out of the Premier League title race by March of last year that they concentrate all of their effort on the Champions League. If that happens again, there's enough quality to suggest that English teams will be back to do damage in the Champions League knockout stages. Number two, what is the real group of death? All of the pundits would have you believe that it's Group F, and certainly it seems like it. Barcelona, Borussia Dortmund, Inter Milan, these are three teams that legitimately could win their domestic leagues, and all three of them have team sheets that look like they can compete uh, in, the, in the Champions League. But Inter have made fewer improvements than both Barcelona and Dortmund, even though they're first in Serie A at the time of recording, they haven't played any of the top eight teams that you would think would compete in Serie A, so the jury's still out on them. So I would say, Consider the possibility that Group H could end up being the real most treacherous group. Like I mentioned, Chelsea has a new coach now, several new players, and possibly even addition by subtraction by losing Eden Hazard and distributing his touches and his goals across new players and guys like Tammy Abraham and Christian Pulisic, which we've already seen. Ajax did lose their two best players, from last season's dream run, but they still return a very strong team. And of course, in the Netherlands, you deal with less of a packed schedule, less competition than some of these other teams from the top five leagues. Valencia has had success in Europe in the past, plus they added guys like Jasper Sillison and Maxi Gomez, and Sillison has been around the great teams in the world because of his time at Barcelona, even though he didn't start in the Champions League. In, uh, over Ter Stegen. And finally, Lille from France. They're largely the same team even without Pepe and Rafael Leao, but they added so much young talent throughout that, and you're seeing it right now of guys that are 22, 20, 18, and it could go one of two ways. Either that means that they're too young to deal with the big stage in the Champions League, or it could mean that nobody really knows how to deal with them, and this young, athletic, just fun style that all of these guys could very well play at Lille would mean that they could surprise some people and look no further than Ajax last season to see evidence of that. Group H could be the most treacherous group this year. Just keep an eye on it. Number three, 
will Neymar implode at PSG? PSG, since they started dumping real money into their team, have a history of disappointing in the Champions League and have never won it. On top of that, their number one guy, their biggest money signing, Neymar, he won it out pretty publicly throughout the summer. And then when he makes a return into the first team at home, fans booed him. And then he goes after the fans and he says, well, now every game is an away game for me. This does not necessarily bode well for a team with so much ego because they have so many great players that all want the spotlight. And you already knew that Neymar may have been a little unsettled by the fact that the young upstart Kylian Mbappe was already stealing his spotlight less than a year from Neymar entering Liga. None of this makes for a particularly good situation for Neymar right now. And the fact that they have to go against Real Madrid in that group, even though it seems like PSG and Real Madrid can see their way clear through to the knockout stages, it still feels like Neymar, it's a ticking time bomb. And PSG may not be able to get through a, an entire eight month Champions League with the dressing room still intact especially because there's been so much controversy before this season about Neymar. This is a situation that you have to keep an eye on because if it's one more year of PSG spending untold riches on their team and failing to get past the finish line, it may be time to blow the entire thing up and that starts with Neymar. Number four, have Juventus finally done enough to reach the promised land. They were pretty underwhelming last year, scoring nine goals, conceding four in a group that included Man United, Valencia, and Young Boys. Then they lost to Ajax in the quarterfinals, scoring five goals in four matches in the knockout stages. To give you some context, Liverpool scored 15 en route to the finals. Only Man United scored fewer goals in the first two rounds of the knockout stage than Juventus did. But almost all of Juventus's acquisitions from this transfer window have been defensive. Guys like De Litt, Danilo, Christian Romero, bringing back Gigi Buffon, etc., etc. Then they lost a terrific attacking fullback in Jao Cancelo and one of their brightest young stars in Moise Keane, who scored six goals in 13 Serie A matches last season at just 18 years old. Juventus identified that they needed more talent to compete and win the Champions League. But did they identify it in the right position group? Giving up goals was not their issue, seemingly. It was scoring them. It was playing attacking football when they were behind, and that came to bite them against Ajax. And it doesn't seem like they've done enough to improve in that particular respect. Obviously, they've won the Scudetto so many times that you feel like, well, it's just a matter of time before they win the Champions League. But the Champions League is a different kind of football than Serie A. Juventus should already know that, and yet they have not focused on the attacking style that they need to, and other teams in Serie A have done that, teams like Napoli and Inter. This might not only be the year that Juventus has to blow up their team because of failure in the Champions League, it may be the year that someone finally unseats them in Serie A because of this idea that Juventus already has enough attacking options and they don't need to add more. I think it's a mistake. I think that they obviously should get to the knockout stages, but when they come up against teams with much better attacking units, they're gonna be in trouble. Number five, did Real Madrid do enough to return to the top? We transition to another Ajax victim from last year. Real Madrid has taken a completely different route to improving than Juventus. They spent 160 million euros on Eden Hazard and Luka Jovic, plus another 45 million on Rodrigo, who had eight goals and three assists as a 17-year-old in Serie A last season. Then they shored up their back line, which was already tremendously stacked with talent, with Eder Militao and Ferland Mendy, plus James Rodriguez is back, Vinicius is healthy, and maybe all of that could take some pressure off of Marco Asensio, who they anticipated would take the spot of Cristiano Ronaldo. 
Of course, they bring back manager Zinedine Zidane, who won three Champions Leagues with Real Madrid. And then what he does is he actually dumps some quality players that he knows wouldn't get playing time and could potentially become an issue in the dressing room. Players like Kovacic, Llorente, Theo Hernandez, Kaylor Navas, Danny Ceballos, etc. Real Madrid seems to be heading in a much different direction that mirrors their run of three straight Champions Leagues, which is high pace attacking football. It's what Zidane loves to play. Their arrivals all seem to suggest that Zidane prioritizes young players, high pace, athletic, attacking style football. That's the kind of football that wins the Champions League. Look at Liverpool this past season, finally unseats Real Madrid and how did they do it? It's the same thing, high paced, high pressure football. That's exactly where Real Madrid are going, where Juventus are, are focusing more on their back line and how to give up fewer goals. Real Madrid is basically saying, you know what? Ajax beat the doors off of us in the second leg of the round of 16. So what we're gonna do is if Ajax, if some other team wants to score three goals, four goals, that's fine, we'll score five or six. It's the strategy that Pep Guardiola has employed at Man City. It's the strategy that Jurgen Klopp employed at Liverpool. It's the strategy that Zidane himself employed at Real Madrid to win three Champions Leagues. No Cristiano Ronaldo, no problem. There's enough quality here, enough depth here, that Real Madrid could see their way clear to winning another Champions League. Number six, more people talking about the Premier League fixture schedule. I mentioned that all four of the English teams in the Champions League this year are gearing up for big Champions League runs. So naturally, there's going to be more discussion about how tenable it is to compete on four fronts like English teams have to. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what exactly can we do to alleviate this problem? We all agree that the teams in the Premier League play too many matches in a short period of time. But what exactly can you do about it? You can't make the season any longer. As it is, players only get two months off, and that's not including international duty. The only way to solve this issue seems to be to reduce the number of teams in the Premier League, or possibly to hold top teams in the Premier League out of certain competitions. Well, you wouldn't want to do the latter because it would mean that the winners of those competitions wouldn't feel legitimate. It would feel like, yeah, you won, but you didn't beat Man City, you didn't beat Liverpool. But you wouldn't want to do the former because it would totally wreck the balance of the Premier League and people and fans hate change. But consider this, is the packed fixture schedule truly a problem for all teams? As much as we hear about it, only six teams from the Premier League compete in Europe which contributes the most added matches to a team's schedule. The rest only have to worry about three competitions, and the League Cup and the FA Cup are relatively short compared to European competition. Six games for each competition if you make the finals. There are six games in the group stages alone in Europe, and English teams now we're used to seeing either getting through to the knockout stages or in the Champions League, going down to Europa and then playing more games. The other thing is the big teams that play this many fixtures are the same teams that are capable of buying more players to use in the League Cup and FA Cups. If you have an issue with those competitions becoming diminished in value, then we should do something about stockpiling players and the amount of money that the top teams have available. Short of that, there's nothing really we can do right now to alleviate that issue. The top teams are going to complain about it, justifiably so, but there's nothing we can do. Number seven, will the BR pre and post match shows be any better? This one's a bit of a joke here to end, but it is something that I'm curious about. I'm a sports television junkie. I love watching this stuff and the pre and post match shows from Bleacher Report just were they didn't cut it for me. They were low energy. It was something weird about how they were structured and this idea that you had two people that were away at some other table talking about stuff, but they joined the conversation sometimes and not others. It, it, it didn't land with me. I mean, obviously this is the pot calling the kettle black, but let's not talk about that. The point is, 
Bleach Report have a lot of money, they have a lot of talent. I want to see a more dynamic, a more energetic pre and post match show to match the energy and just the raw emotion of the Champions League. Every game means something and every match is tremendously high quality because of the teams participating. I want to see the pre and post match shows match that same level of energy and intensity. They have the people that can do it. Thanks for watching this guys. If you want to see more of General Admission content, be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter. We'll see you next time. We appreciate you.